This is the second webinar of the Early, early Career Network of NUGO. And following the, the previous uh, webinar that uh, my, maybe some of you have watched, uh, which when, when we were talking about uh, Metabo Analyst, which is a tool for metabolomics data analysis, today we have Olivia Alder. She's going to talk about Metacore, which is a database and a tool for omics data analysis. Uh, so Olivia has a, had her PhD at the Imperial College London, and she did a postdoc working in cancer in the BC Cancer Agency in Vancouver. And then following that, she was working as a bioinformatician at the University of Leeds in the UK, always working with cancer and analysis of omics data. Now she is a solution scientist at Clarivate, and she she works or she is uh, quite acquainted with Metacore. Uh, so I think uh, um, Olivia can start uh, right now. I just wanted to make a couple of words for those of you who are not familiar with the GoTo platform. So don't worry, uh, we cannot hear you. Your micro microphone is not uh, active. So if somebody needs to talk or to make some noise in your office, feel free. Um, you have a control panel in the in the right hand side of your screen. There you can see that you can uh, you have a space to type questions. So even during the presentation, you're free to type any question or comment that you want to be read at the end of the presentation. Olivia is going to speak for about 50 minutes, and at the end we are going to have a little discussion. So Olivia, thank you very much for accepting the invitation and for hearing, uh, for being here with us today. So feel free. Okay, so you're welcome. Thank you for the invitation. So I just wanted to make it clear that um, you guys as NUGO consortium members have, have access to Metacore and we really encourage you to take advantage of it. Um, so um, this is what I hope to cover with you today. Um, basically, what is Metacore? Because I'm guessing some of the attendees are not so familiar with it. And um, then I was going to go into a live demo. We we're going to use it for some data mining. And then we we're also going to import our own data into it and analyze some results. OK? So what is Metacore? It is essentially a database of molecular interactions. OK? So there's close to 2 million molecular interactions within our database. And where do we get these interactions from? So there's an editorial team, and it's their job to go through the literature, to read paper after paper, and pull out those small-scale interactions based on small-scale experiments. So for example, if there's a co-IP in a paper, and it's proven that two proteins interact with each other, they'll pull out that interaction and index it in our database. OK, so they cover a wide variety of journals, and they also attend conferences to keep their eyes open for things in posters and during talks, OK? And the, the editorial team has been doing this for over 10 years now, and it's made up of MDs and, and PhDs. And um, we really pride ourselves on the manual curation of our database. So we don't use text mining. Um, it's really people reading the full articles and, and pulling out the information so that when you want to find it, you can get straight to it. You don't have to go through reading all those different papers, OK? So one thing we're quite um, well known for is our pathway maps. So these are the can canonical signaling pathways or disease-associated um, signaling pathways. Um, that, that can be pulled out from this database of interactions, OK? So then the more well-trodden paths of cell signaling. I like to think of this process as the editorial team are basically the flame. This is the, the wealth of information out in the public domain in the literature. Um, the editorial team with the flame and they're basically distilling the scientific findings so that you can get straight to the hardcore knowledge. Okay? So I would encourage you, instead of going to PubMed, um, you go into Metacore and, and pull out the information um, more quickly. Okay? And of course, you can read the papers in full in PubMed as well. Um, so you can use Metacore in two ways. You can use it as a data source, so you can go in and knowledge mine within it, or you can upload your own data or even public data or a competitor's data that they've just released in their new paper, and you could 
put it into Metacore and um, that will help you uh, work through and analyze it and really put the results into context. So it really helps you look at the results in the landscape of what's already known, in the context of what's already known in the literature. Okay. okay. You can look at various types of data within Metacore and you can also look at them at the same time. So here we're showing um, variant data being displayed at the same time as RNA-based data. Okay, but you can also upload metabolites, um, variants, and gene expression. Okay, or even structures like compound structures. Okay, so I'm gonna. That's what Metacore is. Now I'm gonna jump into it live to show you how you can interact with it, how you can use it. Okay, so just bear me bear with me when I change screens. So once you've logged into Metacore, this is the page that you'll see. Over here, you, this won't be populated quite so much because I've used it quite heavily, so I have a few data sets within here. But it's basically divided into four panels. All your tools are over here on the right, and a description of those tools are down below. And then this is where your uploaded data sets will live. Okay. So as I mentioned, you can use Metacore in two ways. And the first thing we're going to do is, is data mine within, within Metacore and see what see what's in there that might be useful to us. Okay. So you could search for your favorite gene. Um, I'm going to use the example of BMA L1. You can use what we call the easy search up here on the right. Next search. So Metacore is based on rat, mouse, and human data. So beware of choosing the gene for most appropriate. So I'm going to have a look at um, the human. So you'll notice here that we have all the different synonyms associated with the gene. Um, and it's also called this. So we'll click through. And this takes us to what we call a gene homepage. So it's kind of like NCBI um, in that it'll have a description of, of the gene, its function. So we can see that um, what it is, it heterodimerizes with clock and binds to EBOX enhanced elements and regulates these genes. Okay, and that these genes are important. Um, defects in this gene have been linked to infertility, glucogenesis, and lipogenesis. So it just give you a summary, quick summary, what this gene is known for, what it interacts with a little bit, and, and the diseases it's associated with, okay? But where um, it kind of differentiates itself from NCBI is over here on the left, the table of contents. I really, really encourage you to dive into this, okay? So it's got the diseases that this gene is associated with. So we can see the diseases that it's associated with, but you can also see the interactions. So as I said before, we have a huge database of interactions within Metacore, okay? So here we can see that this gene has been shown to have some interactions with about 370 different molecules. We can filter these interactions if we wanted. So say we wanted to know um, what affects this gene, so what's upstream of this gene, we can just filter based on that. We could also filter based on the mechanisms. So if we want, we want to know that the interaction is by direct binding rather than microRNA binding or ubiquitination. So we can click binding, click apply. And then we can see um, that genes, as expected, the CRIs and the PERS are shown to interact with this gene. Um, personally, I didn't know that part one was meant to interact with this gene. So I can say, oh, I'm not sure about that one. Where's, where's the evidence for that? And the evidence will always be on the right over here. So if I click through, then we can get straight to the paper in which this this evidence has come from. So we can see it's from cell 2010. 
We can link through by the PubMed ID. And we can also see how the editors have indexed this interaction. So we can see the sentence that they pulled out from the paper. And um, we can, what I find really useful is that you can see the tissue in which this interaction has been proven and the methodology that has been used to prove it. Okay. You might have a favorite gene that you hope interacts with this one and you have some kind of inclination that another, another gene is influencing this, this gene in some way. For example, my favorite gene is YAP1 and I couldn't find that it interacts at all with, with this gene here. But I feel like there's, they are connected in some way. So Metacore has some really cool network build in algorithms and I would, I would encourage you to take advantage of these two okay so you can click here on the build network and I'm going to show you how you can connect the dots using our database so one of the algorithms we have is called shortest path and what it enables you to do is to select two genes or microRNA genes compound genes uh, two molecules. I'm just adding YAP1 here. So I have an inkling that YAP1 is somehow connected to BMAL1. Okay. Um, and I think it's connected quite closely. If I thought they weren't connected a bit more loosely, then I could add an additional number of steps between them. And I can click build network. So although I saw um, by looking at the, the, the table of interactions that YAP1 didn't directly interact with this gene, I'm now asking it saying, are there any in-between molecules that, that interact with the two of them? Okay, is there a connection between them in, in any way? I'll just wait for this network to load. Hopefully it won't take too long. Okay, so these are the genes that I started with, BMAL1 and YAP1. And then these are all the ones that connect them. Okay, so we can see that there are a number of ways in which, although these two genes weren't directly connected, only by adding an extra step in, there can be a number of methods in which signaling pathways or um, yeah, signals could pass between these two genes and have an effect on one another, okay? We can ask this to show us the mechanisms by which these interactions take place. So we've got binding here, this is phosphorylation, this is transcriptional regulation, and you can always link back to the literature that those interactions were based on. So the, the um, networks are interactive, so I just clicked on the link, and then here's all the citations that support that interaction and the tissues in which that interaction has been established. Okay. So, also, if you wanted to share this information um, with your supervisor or another member of your team and you can always do that. So you can export the image of this saying, look, I was right, there is some kind of connection between these two genes. Look how many different pathways the signal could go through. So you could just export the image or you could export the interactions themselves. So if we click interactions down here and test, we select the columns, you can see that it's gonna pull out the two different objects that are linked together, the effect and the mechanism. So whether it's activating, the interaction should, should be activating or repressing, um, and also all the references and that are associated with that interaction will come out, okay? Click export. So we're really delving into the database and trying to use it to our advantage. Um, so this is the kind of information that you can pull out and, and share with colleagues or um, supervisors, etc. And you can 
you can say, oh, you could prioritize perhaps which pathway you're going to follow up because we can instantly see that this um, this pathway and uh, between the two with between the two molecules has more citations supporting it um, than, for example, this one. So you might want to prioritize the, the experiments by by um, looking into that interaction first, for example. Okay. So we used easy search to search for a gene. You might not be as gene-centric as me. You might not have a favorite gene that you want to type in and look up and find everything you can about. Um, you might want to type up in a disease name instead and find out everything. Um, oh, that did not quite go to mine. Diabetes. Okay, search. So you can also search on a disease name or even a compound um, that you might be interested in. So you see here, um, first up, it, it will bring genes to the top. But if you look at the objects found, it's categorized the results. So I could click down to the diseases. And then to these diabetes mellitus is at the top. But then you have all the more um, precise definitions below. So we click through just to show you what a disease homepage looks like. So it's very simple here, but and again, all the all the really good stuff is in the table of the contents on the left here. Okay, so we can have a look at all the genes associated with diabetes by clicking on the left. It takes a little bit of time as there are quite a number of genes associated with it. Okay, so we have a huge table here. Over 7,000 associations have been made with the diabetes, but you can see that many of these um, are at the DNA level, so a SNP haplotype. So if we're not interested in those, maybe we want um, just protein level kind of associations, we can of course filter this table down um, by using the options on the left. So perhaps we just want protein level, um, and perhaps we wanted to just limit it, limit it, um, the associations from ones that from a certain tissue. So I might just want to restrict it to adipose tissue. I click apply, and then I've got straight down to twelve targets that I might be more interested in in um, paying more close attention to and following up with. Okay. So we searched on. Uh, a gene, we've searched on a disease and we filtered it. I also wanted to let you know that uh, hiding over on the right here is an advanced search option. So if you really wanted to get down to some really quite tricky questions, for example, um, you just want to pull out all the genes that have an association with BMAL1 and an association with diabetes, for example, then you could use the advanced search over here on the right. I'll leave that for today because it's meant to be more of a tips and tricks session. I just wanted you to be aware that you can perform some quite powerful searches on the database using the advanced search. Okay, so I'm going to head back to the start page. Close a few windows here. I'll let you know just one more way that you can delve into the database without having to upload any of your own uh, data. So. Over here on, on, on the right is a search and browse button. And here you can just really have a look around what, what we've got in the database. I'd encourage you to look at the pathway maps here. I've opened them up already because there's so many of them, it takes a little bit of time to load. So this is the page that you'll come through to. You can see um, that we have um, what we call canonical signaling kind of pathways. And we have a group of folders dedicated to stem cells, and then also what we call our disease maps down the bottom here. So there's there's a number of different um, maps within these folders, but I thought what might be most relevant to this group is pointing out that we have 
um, a dedicated folder for metabolic maps here. Okay, so and within each of these folders, they expand um, to home more maps. So let's have a quick look at one of them. So we can, if you've never looked at one of them before, we can get orientated as to what, I, what I'm talking about. So this is an example of, of one of our maps. And just like the networks we were talking about, they're interactive. So you can get straight back to the literature that supports, supports the interactions within the map. But unlike the networks, these are meant to represent what we call more canonical signaling pathways or more well-trodden um, biochemical um, or molecular biology kind of routes um, through the cells and signaling. So the maps are restricted because there's only certain amount of, of interactions you want to put on, on one map, but we, we understand that all the processes in the cell are connected in some way or another to each other. Um, and so we connect um, the maps to each other as well. So we can see that this, this is feeding into this pathway and that will lead to this process. So you can click through and have a look at that as well. Okay. Um, and then again, we can see from here that leads to yet more processes that we you can click through to and have a look at. So you're not limited to just looking looking at these pathways. Um, you can you can click on them, and you can also export them. So I'm going to show you one one tip in that um, if you're interested in a particular process, a particular pathway map, you can export everything that's on it just as we did with the interactions from the network. Um, and also, I'm not sure how interested many of you will be, but you can get biomarker information out. So we have another database called Integrity, um, and it has a huge component, biomarker component to it. Um, by exporting um, this, let's just do a test so that you can see. Test export. But by exporting all the components on this map, you can it will show you which ones are being used as a biomarker in um, and in which diseases they're being used as a biomarker. Okay, so for example, here this gene here um, is being used um, as as a biomarker. Um, this one here in Australia. Oh, I sent it, sent me through to our other database. I didn't mean to do that. But, um, export. Um, so for, for predicting treatment e efficacy in ulcerative colitis, for example. Um, so biomarkers are, are well characterized and can often have um, chemical assays associated with them. So it may be another way in which you want to prioritize your research. Because what I found in research is there's always so many questions that can be asked it's finding um, which one you want to focus on or which lead you want to follow up on that that can be the trickiest and the more evidence there is out there um, that's probably the best lead to follow up isn't it um, so I just wanted to let you know that that's available um, no, I don't need to do this. okay so that was really what I wanted to cover in terms of data mining in Metacore. So we had a look at to see what interacts with the gene of interest. We built a network um, and we, we had a look at two different molecules and, and, and built a network between them. And I showed you a couple of tips of exporting information out of Metacore and how you could browse through the maps to find signaling pathways that might be useful to you. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to importing your own data into Metacore. And um, your earlier careers um, network group organizers um, gave me the challenge of using a relevant data set that, well, uh, a data set that might be more relevant to you, you guys as an audience. So I did a little bit of browsing and digging, and um, it soon became clear that um, nutrition, and health and well-being and sleep are are intimately linked. So I've I've taken the liberty of pulling a couple of data sets together um, that are based around that. 
Um, so I pulled some metabolite data um, from this um, journal here, from this journal article here, and I pulled some some microarray data from from this article here. So both are, are liver based, and 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 um, are based on, on the finding that BMAL1 um, disruption um, has a link with um, high fat diet and, um, and the disruption to the met metabolites and, um, and the circadian rhythm. Okay, so as I've pulled the um, metabolites yeah, but like data and the RNA seq data from 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 different data sets. Please don't expect any exciting scientific revel revelations. Um, and if you can point me towards a data set that has has the two coming from the one source, I would really appreciate it for for future webinars. Okay, so let's jump back into the software, and I'm going to show you how I upload the data in. Just close a few windows here. Yeah. Um, okay. So as I said, all your tools are over here on the right on your start page. You click upload here, upload experiments. And this is a wizard to help you upload your data. So it tells you how we expect your data to appear. So uh, a gene identifier of some type, um, an expression value followed by a p-value is the ideal scenario. We can use a different different identifiers, whichever um, your data is in. Um, and I'll just show you what I choose while I'm here. Could one of the, the organizers confirm that you're able to see my screen still? It just got a little window pop up saying I was no longer presenter. Yes, you can see it. Yes, fine. Perfect. Okay. So I've uploaded the data and um, the wizard has tried to predict what data I have in each of the columns. So I have my gene symbols with aliases on the left here. And then I have the forward change between I took some, some data from high fat versus um, normal diet at, at I think it was 20 hours um, CZT and then I took that's the fold change and the p-value and click next there's mouse data click next okay so it's once it's uploaded, the bar will fill up. You can go to show location. Okay. So now we can see um, that this has appeared down here with a green tick next to it. So active data sets will have a green tick next to them. If you wanted to inactivate it, you could just click it and it would go from green to gray and no longer be active, okay? So once you've got your data uploaded into Metacall, we highly recommend that you have a look at it. Um, so we have a couple of different ways in which you can do this. So if you go to view and then signal distribution, we can see that the majority of, of this data is falling between zero, three, threefold upregulated and zero and threefold downregulated. And um, that's not really useful when we're wanting to set thresholds that we know that majority is in between here. So you can link, you can click on that and you can get um, a higher resolution. So you see the axis has broken it down more um, between the one and the three. And so we might perhaps want to um, put the cutoff, probably um, lose this bit put the cutoff somewhere around here, okay? So it gives you an idea of the distribution of your data and where you might want to set your thresholds. Close that. 
So once, once you've decided where you'd want to set your thresholds, you could filter experiments. And type in um, the values that you want to filter by and click apply. So if you were unsure about um, where you wanted to oops, where you wanted to put your thresholds, you could do this a number of different times and then compare the results. So you could do, you could be less stringent and more stringent and, and compare the outcome if you wanted. Um, so I don't know what I just did there. Let's have a look. Let's go to the start page. Click refresh. And then some filtered data should that was the curse of the live demo there Okay, I was just muted there for a second. Is it okay to continue? Yep, I'm gonna take that as a yes. Okay, so we have our filtered um, data set now there, and the original is also untouched here. Okay, so you, by filtering, you can always go back to the original and apply different filters if you should wish. One thing that's very important to do if you're wanting to do gene ontology enrichment analysis, so basically see if your differentially expressed genes are involved in, in a process more than you would expect by chance, you must set the appropriate background list. Okay, and to do that, you can go to tools, set threshold and background. And for this experiment, because it was a microarray, we can just choose from, from the drop-down list. There was a mouse. Okay. So once you've applied your filters and your background list, then you can go and do an enrichment analysis. So we have a button here called Workflows and Reports. I recommend doing the enrichment analysis in here. So we click Enrichment Analysis. We'll make sure you've got the appropriate data set selected. Click Next. And then if you wanted to, you could apply filters in here, but because we've already done it, we'll just click Apply. And what it will do is start to do enrichment analysis on, on all these different sections of the database. So we have our pathway maps folder, process networks, diseases, tox toxicity networks, and metabolic networks. Okay. So it didn't surprise me to see that this methionine pathway in transport was um, was enriched, and because the authors had, had had also seen this in the paper in the publication, and so to have a look at um, how uh, how enriched 
it is, like what, what members of the pathway are in which we can click through. Okay, so it's a bit daunting to look at it first, um, but I'll just talk you through a couple of things. So you can see that we have different symbols here, and these represent different types of molecules. So kinases, um, transporters, receptors, um, this kind of thing. But you can always have a look at the legend um, by clicking there, and it will it will give you a legend you can print off. And you'll notice as well that we've got some red um, circles or blue circles by some of the members in this in this network. So this symbolizes the fact that these have been down-regulated by blue or up-regulated in, in red in our data set, okay? So we are having a look at RNA expression at the moment, but I also mentioned that I took a uh, metabolite data set and so you upload this in a similar way to to the um, RNA data set click upload metabolites and it will give you the upload wizard you can use a number of different um, identifiers I just used chemical name um, and then selected the file so it's here I'm just going to activate it now that's the start page that I'm currently on. Um, close that one. Now, when I refresh this, um, we should be able to see the metabolite data is also displayed. So now we can see the, the metabolites rep represented um, by the purple hexagons and um, also displays some, some symbols next to it representing the abundance of these metabolites in the data set or or not and um, we can see that the if we click here and right click and select downstream this will circle everything that's downstream of that methionine and we can see that these are down regulated over here and also these over here are are down regulated too but if I'm perfectly honest with you I find this a bit tricky to visualize and I wanted to show you some tips and tricks how you can get a better visualization of it so if you go to the enrichment analysis window that we originally saw that this methionine pathway or network was enriched in and if you click over here and click that five this will show us the members of the pathway um, or network that were enriched. And we can say, let's go build a network from these and see what they influence. So if I say expand by one, and I want to know what's downstream of these components of this pathway, what knock-on effects is it going to have? So I can click downstream and build. Okay, so then we can see um, what components are, are, are being upregulated and, what, and um, what metabolites are being changed. Um, and we can see that in a much clearer way without all that noise of, of unaffected um, molecules being involved. So it gives us a much clearer picture of our data um, and the process that, that are being affected. Okay, and of course you can, just as we did before, you could export the image or you can ex you can just save it as a network to come back to at a later date, or you could export all the interactions and the supporting evidence just as we did before. And you can also put the effects and mechanisms on top. Okay, we can make big, big. Okay. 
Okay. So that was one way I, I like to simplify the visualization by taking really taking advantage of those build network algorithms at the top there. One other thing you could do is you're not limited to the enrichment analysis, although it's interesting to look at the enrichment analysis, we should probably take a minute to do that. So um, we saw a number of um, pathway maps were enriched in um, liver regulated kind of processes and we can click through to those. But given that we know that the methionine has previously been re reported as, as a significantly uh, upregulated metabolic process, we might want to have a look at our data on all the associated maps um, associated with methionine, okay? So we can just search methionine just as we did with the disease and, and the gene earlier on and we can go straight to the pathways. You can see the pathways, going straight past the map. Um, maps. You can go to the maps that are associated with methionine and, and view those, view our data on those maps. So you can see the components that are are, are changed. Are instead of designated by a circle, they're designated by a thermometer and you can hover over them and, and see the data. Okay. So I've I've talked about what Metacore is. Um, I've shown you a couple of ways in which you can delve into the database and explore your gene of interest, your disease of interest, and extract information out of it to share with your supervisors and colleagues. Um, we had a look at uploading our experimental results and, and had a look at finding enriched pathways and networks and how best to visualize those. So I want to, we've got just coming up for, for 10 minutes for questions. Um, so I want to hand over Unmuted. Take a pause for a minute and um, have a look at the questions, if any have come in. Yeah, thank you very much, Olivia. This was a really nice presentation, and you can see how, how powerful and, and useful the tool is. I particularly didn't know it, but both as a database and as a tool uh, uh, for data analysis, it seems to be pretty good. Um, we have two questions from Yogatama. Um, I can read them for you if you want. So the first, yeah, that would be great. For enrichment analysis, how do you how to do it? If I have Illumina data, since you showed before choosing from Affymetrics, etc. Was it clear? So okay. We... So, so you've got RNA seq data. Is that is that on my understanding? I don't know. You got them. I can <laughs> be the ray data. Data. Okay, so you can also, um, let's have a look at the background list tools, set background list. So you can also um, set it to like a customized gene list as well. So as long as you know every, every gene that was on your array that you've measured in, in your array, then you can upload uh, a gene list and use that as, as your background. Um, so, this because um, we're not limited to RNA data, so so there is arrays, um, but we're not limited to that. For example, if you do a metabolomics experiment, um, you can't then use an array as a background list either. So we have the ability to to upload a gene list and use that as your background list. Okay, so as long as you've got your list of identifiers that were measured in your experiment, you can use that as your background list. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, there is another question. How to get to know whether the pathways is upregulated or downregulated? Any measurable score? Well, maybe that's the thermometer that you were mentioning? Yeah, so I, I, I think you're trying to kind of, because obviously there's, there, there can be an up, upstream molecule that's upregulated, but further down in the pathway, um, something 
might inhibit that or turn it off or be down regulated and so the cascade wouldn't come all the way through to the to the to the bottom um, so you can when you um, do your enrichment analysis you can select just to look at down regulated genes or just to look at up regulated genes um, but there's no way of there's no score associated with um, you know the outcome for your down regulation or up regulation uh, if that makes sense Yes, there is one okay. more from, from, from Guy. Um, is Metacore as good for metabolomics data analysis as it is for transcriptomics analysis? Um, I, I, I have to admit, I, I didn't do research in that area. So I would really ask you to go in and use it and really give us some feedback. Um, I'm going to be really honest with you, like the majority of our customers do use it for transcriptomics analysis. Lots of them just use it as a database to, to get information out of as well. Um, but yeah, I don't know, to be honest. But you can be our, our test cases and, and I'd love you to give us feedback if, if you're finding it useful or not, or if, if there's pathways that you think are missing. Um, please, please do let us know, and I'd encourage you to go and, and browse through those pathways and, and that, the metabolic maps that I pointed out to you um, and, and see if it's comprehensive. Okay, thank you. There is one more from Diu Verke, I think. Sorry for the pronunciation. He's uh, thanking you for the presentation and he's knowing, he's wanted to know, he wants to know if you know how uh, Metacore differs from ingenuity pathway analysis. Okay, <laughs> um, so they are one of our key um, competitors in the commercial space and um, we pride ourselves on uh, the database being manually curated and based on small scale experimental evidence. Okay, so we won't just take, for example, um, genome-wide uh, data, say it's like a yeast-2 hybrid and there's been an association made in the yeast 2 hybrid. We won't just take that and put it in into Metacore. It has to also be supported by a, a validation experiment, a small-scale experiment. Um, I don't think IPA has those kind of um, restrictions in place. Okay. One more, very long, from Guy again. When the number of genes that is uploaded for pathway analysis is increased in a data set, the p-value is improving even for random selected genes. Does the system correct appropriately? Um, that depends if you're selecting the appropriate background list or not. If you're leaving it as default, we would we highly recommend you to select the appropriate background. Okay. One more from Yogatama. Uh, the, the top 10 pathway you showed, does it have a measurable score? such as Z-score that usually are got from PathVisio? Uh, yeah, so I'm um, sorry, I didn't spend much time on that, but um, let's try and grab it up. So so over here on the right, you've got your, your p-value and your multiple tested uh, correction for FDR. So it's based on the high hypergeometric mean test um, as we based all our enrichment analysis on. Okay, so we're just showing the top 10 but of course you can you can you can go further down. Okay, thank you. I, I have a, a short question myself. So when you upload when you updated or when you uploaded metabolomics data you can just upload um, a condition, right? Or you can upload several conditions. For example for a given metabolite one than more right. than one condition. Yeah, so so uh, you can definitely do that with transcript data. When I was fiddling about with it yesterday, it seemed that because I had some time point data, you know, like zero, two, four, six, eight hours kind of data, and um, you would have to um, upload them as separate experiments. Okay. So we can you can upload to up to eight experiments at once, but you would uh, you can't do it in the same file. Um, so if we go to upload, yeah, so 
And here you could do experiment one, experiment two, experiment three, okay. and, and it would just automatically process them. But in the metabolite section, you can only do like one at a time. So I did IDs, data, and then when I was looking to see whether I'd do two, four, six, eight hours, I was uploading again, then two hours, then four hours, then six hours. And you can display up to eight at a time. So unfortunately, you can't upload the whole eight together, though. OK. Well, thank you. Um, I don't know if there is any question that I'm not seeing, or if you have something else to say, maybe. Uh, Sara, do you see some other questions or something that you um. I just uh, read, uh, it's not a question, it's just uh, the last comment of uh, Guy Berger that say that, uh, well, sorry for the follow-up uh, on my previous question, and uh, he said that uh, even if, if the background is selected appropriately, uh, his experience is that it is best to compare data sets with similar numbers of genes. I don't know, Olivia, if you want to just add some something more. Uh, I no, I'm, I don't have anything more to add, really. Um, I guess um, it, yeah. I so gene ontology analysis is just that it's one way of analyzing your data. I wouldn't base, I wouldn't put all of my eggs in one base basket based on gene ontology analysis. It's it's meant to drive hypotheses and follow up experiments and to complement um, wet lab kind of experiments, right? Like you wouldn't go into the lab and just do one experiment um, and then that would be the basis of your conclusions or discussions in your manuscript that you, you need to follow up from different angles, right? Um, so I, I hold my hands up and I say I think gene ontology has its weaknesses, um, but I also think it can guide you um, and find clues in your data. Okay, Guy, thanks uh, you for the for the, the answer. And uh, the last one uh, by Martina Poletti that asks you if uh, there is a way to overlap two canonical pathways or networks. Yes, is it you can merge. Yes, you can you can merge um, networks. So although we can't merge um, pathways, what you could do, I showed you how to export components of a pathway. So you could export all the components of a pathway, make them into a network, and export all the components of a second pathway and make them into a network, and then you could merge networks. Um, do I have any networks built that I could show you quickly? Okay, I can't show you right now, but I will follow up with screenshots um, of how you can merge networks, if that's okay. Okay, so I think no more questions. Uh, thanks a lot, Olivia, because uh, it was a very interesting presentation and uh, several questions, and it means that also the attendees were really interested uh, about the topic, and uh, Jardé, I think you have to give more information about. Yes, I have the, just a, a last reminder to the to the all the attendees that are associated with Nugo. We do have a, uh, a how do you call that a license to use the software. So you just have to contact our secretary Inge Borg and to know how to how we can use this. So the the, the tool is there. It's up to us now that we have the training to use it. I would like once more to, to thank Olivia for the nice presentation, for her time, and to advertise the next uh, talk that we are going to have in our webinar series. Uh, the date is not yet uh, fixed, but we believe somewhere in June, Valentini Constantinidou is going to talk about career options, so kind of a career advice session, uh, talking about career options outside the academia. She has her own uh, experience as an entrepreneur, so it's going to be also a very nice topic. Uh, do you have something else to add, Olivia? No, just thank everyone for their time, and, and if they have any questions when they get to using Metacore, feel free to contact me. I'll send on, you have my details, so. Okay. Um, yeah.
Well, this, um, this presentation is going to be available in the website of NUGO. It was recorded, so everybody can watch it again if you want and, and get more questions. So thank you very much, for everyone, and I hope to see you or hear you in the next session. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.